Okay, I kind of combine module five and six. Um, I think I had different plans for it. And then I realized that, oops, I might have like expanded it a bit too much. So I'm combining it together. Yeah. Okay. So in the final bit, we're using spatial statistics for data interpretation. So I thought about why I wanted this. I am not an expert in spatial uh, statistics. <clears throat> in fact, I'm not an expert in statistics. I don't even like statistics. <laughs> no, I really don't. It's not mathematics. It's like an alternate reality module, you know, that we are just, yeah, it's a crossover, it's alien. But anyway, um, but I think it's very important. Okay, now, if you start, right, from module one, from module two, three, and four, everything that you have learned is all about, um, about the tissue, all right? So the tissue has a certain structure, it has... Um, a certain nature, so you need to treat it right, so garbage in, garbage out. And then in your next module, what did you learn? So once you have set the standards for your, um, what do you call it, your tissue quality, all right, and uh, you've maintained it to a, to a rigorous standard, so then you get your data output. And then your data has to be presented in a way so that when we analyze it, we can get um, what do you call it uh, information in which we can make sense of it, right? It's all about making sense of what, of your data, right? So that's module uh, three, and then we went on to module four. So module four um, is the part where you bring in your spatial. Uh, platform back again. So that is really the, the settings, the actual environment in which you are overlaying now all your data that you have analyzed, and then you're drawing these boundaries. You're trying to understand if you need to, if you have defined these boundaries well, so that your interpretation will be will be valid and how we can look at interactions in in a, at different scales. So you can look at it at the level of your single cells, you can look at it at the level of your subcellular uh, uh, collective organizations. But the thing is, your cells are more than that in a tissue, right? So they are forming communities. So I talked about this at the beginning of uh, module four in the lecture. So they are collective communities, they are populations, they're interacting with each other. And many of these uh, models that we build, for instance, including our deep learning, whether it's your deep learning algorithms for segmentation, or whether it is BASOR or PROSIC, which is based on probabilistic models of distribution, these work only because at the spatial setting, all right, your cells are organized in a meaningful way. There is no pattern to capture if everything is random, right? And it's just noise, right? So there's no value in it, and there's no uh, function, there's no property that we want to that is desirable for us to study. But the thing is, um, we ourselves we cannot understand these spatial rules. We cannot understand these relationships, and that is because it's something that is very new to us, but it's not new to let's say those who have, so those scientists who work on geographical location, uh, mapping, cartography, they know this, they know that every point on earth has got a spatial relationship. The way forests are, the trees in a forest are arranged, the way they grow, the way a fire spreads, all has got spatial relevance, right? So the fire spreads, but it will spread in a region that is specially conducive for it to, to spread. Uh, uh, trees will die in massive uh, clusters, but there'll be clusters of trees that will be left alive. And there is a special, uh, what do you call it, pattern to it. And 
if you look at your liver, you look at your brain, everything is organized in orders of relevance, right? They all have a pattern. Our brain has got a frontal lobe, it's got an occipital lobe, as a temporal lobe, right? So there's a reason why there is the, all these divisions. We don't really know much about it, but we are all constrained by it. So if there's any changes to these patterns in a disease state or during an act of action, it is going to be very complex because when you look at when you when you're at the at the single cell level already, we were struggling with complexities, right? At the single cell level, we were already struggling with oh, I have all these cell types now. Now I realize I have a hundred different subtypes of astrocytes. What have we done about the hundred different um, uh, different subtypes of astrocytes, right? So the, we already saw that complexity. So that is where statistics comes in. That's why all these models, all right, statistical models are important because they kind of give uh, what is the error that is associated if you compare and contrast between these two. And you don't have to understand it, but I think if you can appreciate it and uh, include it, I think that would be great. So for, for spatial, if you want to know so now it's about organization. You want to understand if an organization has got uh, a value to it. So now, like, uh, I mean, it was a very lame example, maybe. So I, I, I said how each of you are sitting like in fixed distances because you don't know each other. But that's really how cells also behave, right? So cells that work in unity, they will be clustered or organized in a spatial domain. And other cells will be out and it's the same for your molecules as well. So the reason why um, base or NCV or speech to x graph neural network clustering or molecules work is because of the fact that they are attracted to a common domain based on their function. But the thing is, how do you conclude if the non-randomness that you see is valid or not? So humans, we are not really good at, uh, we are very good at seeing patterns, but like I said, sometimes we are kind of over generous in, the, in, in what we think is a, is a pattern, you know, because our brain is, is tuned for it. So for instance, we see spatial patterns everywhere. So a simple question would, would you be able to identify dif the differences in their spatial distributions from the image that I've shown you? So the bottom image, that is a dispersed image. But that's not random. Over dispersion is not random, like I said. So that is non-random. That is an over dispersed model at the bottom. Now the top two, it seems to me at least, both of them are clustered, but they are differently clustered, perhaps. But one of it is just random Poisson model. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, what do you call it, based on statistics on um, inhomogeneous uh, point processes. And the other one is actually clustered. But you and I will not be able to identify it. But a good statistical model will be able to identify it. So now why is that important? Because if you are having a diseased brain or you're having treated versus untreated, there are a lot of things that, that's going on, all right, when you treat. So one of my experiences was that when I was uh, a PhD student, when I used to deliver antisense uh, drugs into the ventricles, and the drug, it's an antisense, it's just, it's just RNA, and it will spread and it will distribute throughout the tissue. And the thing is, to me, it seems like it is well distributed but I could see that certain pockets of the mouse brain were not getting the drug, all right? But how do I then compare it with a, with a with the antisense that is targeted? So it seems like both, all right, is well distributed. They are both missing certain regions of the mouse brain, but how do I compute that, right? So that is where spatial statistics comes in. You can actually understand which is more distributed, which is less and which is uh, co-located with another cell type. So these are things that you would want to apply once you finish like the work in module one, two, three, and four, because then you want to, so imagine now 
you finish modules, uh, your analysis that is given to you that is similar in module two and three, and then you finish your module four, now you have clusters of cells that you know is that belongs to a certain, uh, let's say, spatial domain in your tissue, and you have these different cell types. Now, how are these different cell types organized within that cluster? Are the astrocytes closer to your neurons, or are your neurons further apart um, from your oligodendrocytes? Is there an increased infiltration into your um, corpus callosum? let's say, um, in an AD model or an MS model, right? But how do you quantify these? So this is where spatial statistics comes in. We're just going to test out uh, two of it and to give you an impression of what you can get. So you, I, would, I would recommend that you read, that you read this, uh, this paper, all right? It's not a difficult paper. It's a very short paper to... And it will um, kind of uh, induct you into spatial statistics. Um, for those of you who already know what spatial statistics is, that's and this this paper will probably be um, probably be not advanced enough. Yeah. So we are dealing with point statistics. So on your on your left and the bottom row. All right. So I liked this. Um, I really like this diagram because it really gives you a sense of what we we kind of will observe when we look at our spatial data. And it's kind of true as well for any of us who has done um, what you call it, the human or who have been on the human cell at last projects or similar work. So at the top is where your molecules or your cell types are completely random. All right. And where at the bottom, they are over clustered. And then in your second column, all right, you again have your one region. So in this case, it becomes a bit more complex. You have a region in which both molecules are over dispersed. And then you have a region in which both molecules are uh, um, maybe uh, a bit clustered together. But at the bottom sphere, you only have one sample, which is the green, which is clustered. But relative to the green block, the gray markers here or the gray points here are dispersed. So in one setting, you only have one point and it's easy, right? When it's just one point. But when you're starting to evaluate the relationships between your cell types or between your Leiden clusters or between your spatial clusters, then you're looking at how they're interacting with each other. And very often, that is what is important. You're trying to look at how these two groups, these two spatial groups, or within my spatial domain, how the different cell types are interacting with each other, or cell states. And you don't even need to have cell states or cell types, because like I showed you in the NCV model, you can simply look at gene groups or gene sets in this case. Right. So some of the things that uh, we take it for granted in a tissue is uh, not only do we have um, the issue of cell, so we have this issue of segmentation. So what, what makes segmentation hard, as um, I've told you before, one of the things is that it's really difficult to segment your DAPI, especially when cells are uh, very clustered together and they are very close together. But the thing is, if you really look at um, um, cell density, right? Cell density itself is a story itself. So very often your cell density, all right, will change according to its function as well. So when I used to do lots of um, staining of uh, the human brain or fetal brain, you'll find different cell densities as you go from your ventricle, from your subventricular zone to your outer ventricular zone to your inter, your, to your interzonal ventricular zone to your cortex. So the densities keep changing. And these, and these changes in density, which you can also compute. So you don't always have to compute something, something very, very complicated like 
um, a gene signature or an NCV, something very simple like cell density changes across your tissues will also tell you a story. Why? Because your cell density changes, it also means that the ECM surrounding those cells are also changes, right? Are changing, right? And isn't ECM part of the microenvironment as well? There's lots of signaling, lots of molecules, lots of interactions, uh, molecular gradients that's happening there. And we're not catching any of those unless, all right, you want to combine your Xenium with MassPack. And you can do that too, right? Your Xenium, you can take the slide out, slide out, or you can give an adjacent slide, you can send it from MassPack you'll have ECM signatures. So these are profound ways in which you can couple your, your experiments. And then the other thing is intensity. Now, when I, when I selected Bangsi for, for, um, as a demo to, to, to kind of bring about the point about spatial clustering, it wasn't just because it was, um, yeah, it was simple to use and it, it was very well structured for, for lessons. But the thing is, the thing about Bangsi is that it also introduces the concept of using computer vision. Now, computer vision algorithms are very, very powerful algorithms because what they are, what they are doing is they are basically finding patterns. All right. An image is not just an image, it's a pixel. And spatial transcriptomics was not the first technology that uses spatial images, use spatial information, all right? Um, all the analysis that has been done on images, they all use spatial information. It's just that it's not apparent, but you are looking at the distributional properties and the distributional relationships between your pixels. That's how your neural networks learn. We might not know the fundamental algorithms that, or the math, or the functions that's going on that it's picking up, that it's that it's crafting, but it is learning these associations between pixels. That's all that is doing. All right, that is what is it cannot it cannot see what is not there. All right, it cannot see beyond it. Okay, so now all right, that computer vision algorithm. And that's why I brought up the, the idea that you can implement your own algorithms. You can implement your own, um, what do you call it? Um, even an AI model to extract these features because the pattern of cellular distribution also matters. So if a gradient is changing from region A to region B, all right, you don't, you don't just want to look at the differences in the cell types, right? You want to see how the gradient is changing. So if the gradient is changing and midway, it is showing a different infiltration of cells and infiltration is a very important concept in cancer biology. And also in at least, and I mean, definitely in GBN it is, right? So you have all of these um, gradient measurements and we don't take into account when we just do our clustering and cell type labeling and um, just finding proportions of cell types in different regions. You also want to mark out the gradients of changes. Now, another thing is that sometimes distributional patterns are extremely difficult to, to um, assist in. So in a tissue, right, you also have to be, as much as all of these statistical um, evaluations are important, and this is not just, this is not just true for spatial statistics, this is also true for module two and module three, the way we cluster, all right, and define our cluster is that, like I mentioned in the previous um, module, I think someone asked me a question, I cannot remember, is that we do not have sufficient spatial coverage to understand if um, the spatial relationships that we see is real or not. We do not have the strength. We do not have the strength of the power of analysis. We don't have that, right? So the thing is, if I were to expand my experiment and now I include it from the same surface, all right, I, inc I included patch A and patch B from the same patient, together with the additional spatial information, it's going to tell me a different story. It's going to give me a different relationship. Right. So now imagine just within that tissue itself, all right, 
sometimes you'll see lots of blood vessels. All right. Now, it is natural that when cells hit a barrier, they will try to circumvent it by moving around it. And we might wrongly assume, all right, that when we see cells that are clustered around a blood vessel, that, oh, look, you know, I see clustering of my immune cells, or I see clustering of some cells or some cell state. But it could just be like, you know, look, these blood vessels are getting in my way. So, you know, I just want to circumvent it. So these are things that we will not know, but we will assume because we don't have enough of that spatial information. Because at that point in time, just like single cell RNA sequencing, your spatial information that you receive, it is static. At that point in time, you're capturing that state that it exists in, right? So that is why we need to have all of these uh, pattern descriptors. So one kind of pattern descriptors will be computer vision. Um, the other kind, I think, would also be statistical tools that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you two of them, all right? And uh, you can understand. And then there is this thing of scale, all right? So this last diagram at the bottom. So this there's, thing, there's this important thing about scale that is very important in any kind of uh, pattern description model. And this is something that in imaging, we do it all the time, is that at different scales, all right, my pixel distribution will tell me a different story. Because I can have cells which are very clustered. So if I just zoom in on a blood vessel, on all the capillaries, they'll all look the same, right? I mean, of course, they'll all look the same. They're all round, and you know, they're all the epithelial cells, nothing different. But when I make my window larger, I'm going to see a difference. I will see that in some regions, I will have capillaries associated with a certain cell type and they are close together, all right? And then in a different region, I'll have a different pattern. So the same thing that we found in Bangsi as well, all right? Why is spatial clustering so difficult? Because you do not know what is the spatial resolution to fix, all right? We are still discovering, especially for many of us who are working on disease tissues, is much harder. So that's why the scaling matters. If you look at one scale, you miss out information on the other scale. So this is an important concept. Whenever you find, whenever you want to understand patterns in nature, you know. So it's like a leaf, right? So you, a leaf has got. So leaves were really. I think it was really leaves and plants where all of these pattern descriptions started, you know, plant biology, you know, and insect biology, you know, because that's when all of these pattern descriptions started to get formed and we are just uh, applying it now to our own um, settings as well. Uh, no more break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'll just go into uh, module five and six, all right? It doesn't want me to escape. No, not yet. Okay. 